Well, I'm thankful for grace tonight. Amen. Thank God for his unchanging, unfailing, and amazing grace. Where would we be if we got what we deserved? But thank God that he did not give us what we deserved, but instead he gave us what we never could earn. And that was the love of Jesus Christ shown to us at the cross. I heard people use that word scandalous all throughout songs, and I wondered, what do they mean by that? But when you think about it, that we were the ones who had earned the deserved punishment of death. But Jesus took our place. And what a scandal that would be to think that somebody with so great a debt would be able to get off uh, scot-free. But yet, here we are tonight as forgiven and redeemed sinners in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank God for it tonight. Well, take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms and chapter number 11. Psalm chapter number 11, and I'm going to preach tonight just from a few verses here in this passage of Scripture. I learned something uh, when I started studying at Shorter, that uh, the entire book is called Psalms, but an individual is called a psalm. So I had a professor, Dr. Connell, he said, you call the book Psalms, but you say I'm preaching from Psalm 11. So for those of you who care about that, there you go. And now you know if you didn't already. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture uh, to really understand the context of it. You, and, and this is one thing you don't need to ever miss about the Psalms, especially the ones that are written by David. There's always a context behind every Psalm that David writes. And so what you can do is you can go to the historical books, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles. Because if you've got a good study Bible, it'll usually point this out for you. And you can find what was happening in David's life, and then you can really begin to understand what the context was for his writing. I never forget when Brother Ron was here several years ago in revival, and our choir sang, Thou, O Lord. And we had sang that song many times, but I remember Brother Ron telling us the context for which David was writing that psalm. He was being pursued by his own son. And ever since he said that, I never even thought about that, never studied that out, that whole song took on a totally different meaning for me because I understood the context of why David was writing. Psalm chapter 11 was one that was in our Bible reading. And it's one of the first psalms that David writes, and we know this because he is writing during his time of service in the court of the very first king of Israel, whose name is Saul. David was in the house of Israel. He was one of the best friends of Jonathan. Matter of fact, they were so close friends uh, that they loved one another with a deep and abiding love. Saul did not feel the same way about David that his son felt. Jonathan loved David with an undying love. Saul was threatened by David. In fact, Saul goes out to battle and uh, he slays a giant. What's his name again? Is that his name? Goliath. I thought that was a ride at Six Flags. His name is Goliath. And when they come back to the palace, they're singing the praises of not Jonathan, not even Saul, but they're singing a song of praise to David. They're saying, and this is what's worse, they invoke Saul in the song. They say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Well, my, my, how that must have erupted the pride of Saul. And he said, we cannot have this. And see, so he goes into a pursuit of David. David leaves the palace. David is fleeing from the hand of Saul. But how many of you know that you can only run from fear so long until you've got to turn around squared in the face and say, listen, I know you're bad, but my God is more mighty than that which you're trying to inflict upon me. And that's about the place David's come to in this Psalm, chapter 11. He's like, I'm sick of running. I ain't running anymore. Uh, I know the God that's on my side. 
And so I guess tonight I'm speaking to you, if you're like me, and you're, you're often beset by anxiety, if you're often beset by fear, if you're often beset by what is unknown, then tonight take comfort in the fact that God is greater than any storm uh, that you're walking through. My friend Barry Snap said several weeks ago in a sermon, he said, God walks on the stuff that you are drowning in. I, I thought that was pretty good. I asked him, I said, I don't know if you came up with that, but that's good if you did. And that is so true. Uh, when we're underneath problems, God is on top of them. When you feel like you cannot win, God has already won for us. So listen to what the psalmist says here in Psalm chapter 11 and verse number 1. In the Lord I put my trust. It's like a purpose statement, isn't it? David says, listen, let's just get it out of the way right here off the bat. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, Flee as a bird to your mountain. For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. The foundations are destroyed. What can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked, the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Can I just insert something right there? You've heard, your, you've heard all your life the same thing I've heard. God loves sinners, but hates sin. When you square that up with verse 5, come to me and straighten out my theology, would you? The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence. His, it's a capital H in my Bible, his soul hates. I've been hated by many people, I'm sure, but I don't ever want to be, and I know I won't because I'm in the family of God, I'm in the redeemed, but I don't ever want to be in that position with the Lord. Verse 6, upon the wicked he will rain coals. Fire and brimstone and burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, and he loves righteousness, and his countenance beholds the upright. Father, help us to preach tonight with Holy Spirit anointing. And God, help us to do through this time what we cannot do in our own strength and our own power, but what we can do if you will help us. Father, tonight I pray that you give me unction and anointing during this time. And I pray that you'd speak through me now in a way that only you can. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. Let me just, uh, I've been preaching uh, on Sunday morning. I've been taking verses and kind of preaching topical messages, I would say. So tonight, man, I just want to do what I believe I do best, and that is, let's just walk through the text verse by verse. And I want to preach on casting out fear tonight. Casting out fear from Psalm chapter number 11. I want to divide this text up in three sections. I want to look at verses 1, 2, and 3. I want to then look at verses 4 and 5, and then I want to look at verses 6 and 7 from this passage of Scripture. And I want to talk about what kind of faith it takes to cast out fear. Number one, let me just give you a very basic thing. Number one, if you want to cast out fear, it takes a fearless faith. If you want to cast out fear, it takes a fearless faith. If you want to understand the real context of this passage of Scripture in Psalm chapter 11, you can go to 1 Samuel 18 and 19, and you'll find the situation that David finds himself in. He is running from Saul. Saul is pursuing him not with the intent to punish him, not with the intent to imprison him, but with the intent to kill him. And David in these first three verses is answering somebody, and we don't really know who he's answering, but he, he's talking to somebody. Matter of fact, you could say since it's a psalm, he's, he's singing to somebody. And listen to what he says. He says, in the Lord I put my trust. You know what that tells me? Somebody's telling David to put his trust in something else other than the Lord. He says, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Now listen to me right here. 
Do you think somebody came up to David and said, David, you can't trust in God anymore? Do you think people came up to David and said that? Why, heavens no. They came to David and they appealed to human reason and logic. They said, David, you are being pursued. They said, David, the logical thing for you to do when you're being pursued is to run as far away as you possibly can from the pursuer. Now let me ask you something tonight. If you're being pursued by an enemy, does it make sense to get as far away from that enemy as you possibly can? Nod your head and say, "Uh uh-huh. It makes human sense. But what what if God has given you promises that nothing that comes against you will be able to take you down? What if God has given you promises that no matter what enemy you face, that God's made a covenant with you, God's made a promise with you, God's got a purpose for you? Remember, the prophet's already come down to the house of Jesse. The prophet's already come down there to the house and looked at all of those sons and said, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. And he said, is this all of your sons? And Jesse says, I got one son in the field, but he's ruddy and runny, and you don't want anything to do with him. He's just a keeper of sheep. And Jesse says, that's the one I want. That's the one that God wants. Why? Because God does not look on the outside as man does, but he looks on the inside at the heart. And so God had chosen David for a purpose. God had chosen David for a plan. And David looked at the people who said to him, you better run as far away from Saul as you can. And he said, I know what human reason says. I know what sounds logical. I know what sounds like it ought to make sense. But I'm going to stay right here, and I'm going to believe that the promises of God are faithful and worthy to be trusted in. David had a fearless faith. David had a faith that could not be wavered by circumstances. Now, was it always so? Well, I'd say no. But I'll tell you this. The overall course and conduct of his life was summarized in this way. David was a man that was after God's own heart. See, that good news tonight that God's not asking you to be perfect? God's not asking for sinless perfection. But the course and conduct of your life ought to be characterized by trust and belief. How can you call yourself a Christian and live in unbelief and total lack of faith and doubt? Brother Billy, you're going to like his sermon tonight, aren't you? How can, how can we call ourselves Christians and believers and, and, and live in constant and perpetual doubt? I don't know about you, but every time I get into a state of worry and anxiety, I feel conviction. Because at my very basic sense, my worry is rooted in the fact that I do not trust God enough to take care of me in the way that He has already promised that He would. You say, Blake, you're not David. You're right. I'm a New Testament believer. And I would say to you tonight that as a New Testament believer, I probably have more promises to bank on than David even did in his time on this earth. Oh, you ought to go all all the way through there and find all the things that God calls. He calls us joint heirs. He calls us victorious conquerors. He tells us we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Raised us up together with Him and seated us together in heavenly places. I've got a lot of promises to bank on tonight that ought to cause me not to live in fear. To flee from the danger that was upon David would have been to participate in an act of unbelief. As well, it would have been an act of cowardice. David's friends urged him, David, flee to the mountains. David said, how can you say that to my soul? Isn't it funny how David says, how can you say it to my soul? What did David's mind say? David said, I'm here. David's mind said, I'm here. Saul is there. Saul is coming this way. I'm this way. So I should go that way. Make sense? Here's A. I'm B. A is trying to come to B, so I need to be on over to C. But listen to me, promises, God, are believed in the soul. Why does the Bible say we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith? Because faith and belief is in the deepest parts of our soul. And can I tell you something about your soul? Your soul is how you communicate with God. 
It is the deepest place that only the Word of God can reach into. For Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing and piercing us, even separating spirit and soul. Only the soul can do that. David said, listen, whoever you are that's telling me to flee, how could you say this to my soul when God has given me these promises? What, what are they saying? They're saying, flee as a bird to your mountain. Well, it was a desperate situation. David's life was in danger. And Saul sent his posse, his people, onto David's trail. And they are, according to verse 3, bending their bow. What does that mean? It means they're getting ready to start firing the arrows at David as we speak. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. I don't know why, but it just reminds me when I think about that picture of a bended bow and arrows. It takes me to Ephesians 6 where the Bible says that the devil is... Con We've been talking about this a lot in our angel study, that the, the devil is constantly firing darts of fire at the believer. And the only way that we can withstand is that we would be suited up with the armor of God. Not only was it in David's soul where it was where the promises of God were kept, but it was in David's soul where he communicated with God. And can I tell you something tonight? If you don't have constant communication with God, you're not going to believe God. If you don't have fellowship with God, if you don't have communication with God, if you don't spend a long time with God, you're not going to believe what God has said is true for you. Can I testify in my own life? Anytime I, I, I get into anxiety and to worry and to fear, I can always trace it to the fact that I am slipping away in my relationship and fellowship with God. I can always trace it back to that place. When I'm near to God, when I'm in close communion and fellowship with God, when my sins are taken care of, when I've confessed, when I'm clean, I can believe what God says because I know that what He says is true. And let me say this as well. I've tested it. See, the longer you walk with God, the more testimonies you get of your own. And you can say, I don't just have to believe the Word of God, but I can recall times in my own life when God said something and He proved that it was so. I have seen the hand of God be faithful in my life. They may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. Listen to what he says in verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The, the Bible here is comparing this situation to a building. The foundations upon which it rests are two. The first one is a, is a basic and elementary principle of the Old Testament, and that is of the law. Now you say, preacher, explain that to me. Well, the law is simple. When you do wrong, you get punished. If you steal, you receive punishment for it. If you kill, you generally get killed. If you commit adultery, you experience the uh, repercussions of those actions. That's what the Old Testament is based upon. In, in fact, did you know something that none of the people that are anti-God in the world want to tell you today? Almost every system of law in the world is based upon what was found in the Old Testament. You ever heard that taught in schools? I think not. The system of law was a basic system that existed in the Old Testament. What you do is what you get paid for. There was a second principle that ruled in the Old Testament, and that was a, that was a principle of justice. Justice. One of the things that grieves the heart of God the most in the Minor Prophets, those 12 books at the end of the Old Testament that are some of the shortest books in all the Old Testament, all the Bible. One of the things that grieves the heart of God the most is that justice has been abandoned. One of the things that Nehemiah does in chapter 13 at the end of the book of Nehemiah is he sets the whole nation straight. And he does it by dealing with those who have taken corrupt bribes, those who have used their position of power to oppress those who are poor. And God was absolutely fed up with it, and he used Nehemiah to bring punishment to those who were committing these sins. And here's what they say to David. David, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Listen to what they're saying here. They're saying, David... 
You're living in a system which is not fair. You're living in a system which is not equitable. You are a runt of Jesse. Saul is the king of Israel. And whether you have a grievance or not, it does not matter. Because he is in the position of power here, and you are not in the position of power. And Saul looks at him and says with a fearless faith, he says, do you think that God's promises are put on hold just become, because somebody who has a little earthly power is pursuing me in this instance. David says, it does not matter who pursues me. God is still God. What God says still goes. And just because somebody with a little bit of power thinks that they can overturn what God has said, it ain't gonna happen. Anybody can believe God when the pantry's full, when the bank account's stuffed, when the kids act like they ought to, when the marriage is rolling on just like it ought to roll, when the church is acting right, when the tithes are right, when the members are acting like they ought to act, and everybody's at peace and fellowship with one another, anybody can believe God in those moments. But it is when all hell breaks loose in our life that we are really tested. Do I believe what God has said is so in my life? I don't know who said it, but it's true. You're either going into a storm, you're either in the middle of a storm, or you're either coming out of a storm. Oh, anybody believe God when everything's right? Anybody can believe that what God has said is true when all in your life is going right? But it is in those moments when we find ourselves beset by the enemy, beset by our flesh, beset by those around us, that we must trust even still in those moments. David, the foundations of law and justice are destroyed. You're in a position of vulnerability. Look at David's response. Let me give you the second point. Number one, he has a fearless faith. Let me give you the second thing. He has a founded faith. Look at what David says in verse 4. The Lord, I love this, is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Do you remember when you were a kid and you, uh, well, maybe y'all weren't like that, but when I was a kid, I hated to stay at home by myself. I had a serious fear of staying at home by myself. Didn't want to be by myself, just scared. And so periodically I would go and check and make sure that there was still somebody in the house because I wanted to make sure that there was still somebody there that could protect me if things went haywire. You know, when I was a kid, you didn't even have to fear about that, but now you genuinely do. I told Tiffany the other night, I said, you telling me that our baby's going to be sleeping in the other room 10 feet away from us? I said, I don't know how I feel about that. It's scary. There's a window in there. People try to get mess with my baby, you know. I'm getting 9 and 45. Ta-da. Anyway. But I can remember checking and just making sure, make sure somebody's home. I won't be by myself. Job said this. He said, I, I looked to, to the left and, and the Lord wasn't there. He said, I looked to the right and he wasn't there. He said, I looked behind me and I couldn't find him. I'm going to tell you something, Job. God ain't moved. Brother L.A. Tapp used to say there was two old people who'd been married for 50 years, and the wife looked over at him as he was driving down the road, and she said, I never forget L.A. telling this story all the time. He said the wife looked over at him, and she said, you know, we don't sit close to each other anymore like we used to. And he looked at her, and he said, the steering wheel ain't moved. These friends obviously looked at David and they said, David, what, what in the world do you base this fearlessness on? Matter of fact, they didn't say fearlessness. But you know what they probably said. David, you're reckless. You are reckless. Listen, you want to be faithful in the promises of God to be some people around you in your life to say, man, you're, you're nuts. Somebody was just telling me today, I was having a conversation, they started talking about tithing. And somebody at their work said, yeah, I try to give $2 every week. And they looked at him and said, $2? What? And then when they told them what they gave, they looked at them and like, you give that to the church? Yeah, she's like, 10%, yeah. 
That's reckless. Money's just one example. You start sharing your faith with people in the workplace. And you're radical. Stop taking your kids to every extracurricular activity because you want them to be in youth group or Awana on Wednesday night. Radical. David, you're reckless. What gives you the audacity to think that you ought to stay here and not go to the mountains. You know, I don't, I don't think David had written Psalm 137 yet. But the principle was already true in David's life. David said, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's stone is in heaven. You know what David said in Psalm 137? He said, Lord, if I rise to the heavens, you're there. And he said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. David said, if I'm dead in the grave, you're with me. If I'm standing in your very presence, you are with me. You have made me. You know me from my sitting down to my rising up. They said, David, what gives you the audacity and the, and, the, and the belief that you can just stay here? David said, because no matter where I am, I know where God is. God is on his throne. He has not moved. And that is where my confidence comes from. The Lord is in his holy temple. One Bible scholar said this. I love this. He said, others judge by the appearance of the moment. But David's faith beholds the heavenly ruler exercising his sovereignty. There's a lot of big words in that last half, but don't miss what he says. Others judge by the appearance of the moment. Who are they? They're those people Paul wrote to in Ephesians when he said, you're blown about by every wind and doctrine. Well, I'm rooted until the storm comes and then you can't find me in church anymore. I'm rooted in until something happens in my life that chokes the life out of me spiritually and then you cannot find me anymore. The Bible scholar said, Others judge by the appearance of the moment, but David looks and he reminds himself that God is in heaven, God is in his holy temple, God is on his throne, and as long as God's not walking back and forth biting his fingernails wondering how we're all going to make it, then I know that I'm okay because I'm with him. That David had a founded faith. It was based on some. People say, oh, you Christians, you just believe some book of fairy tale." Listen, I got a founded faith. It's built on something that I've tested with my own life. And I have found it to be faithful and true. Love that. Others judge by the appearance of the moment. But David's faith beholds the heavenly ruler. That's God exercising his sovereignty. God's never not exercising his sovereignty. God is never... Not, I know that ain't right English. God is never not exercising his authority. He's always God. He's always sovereign. He's always in control. So Blake, if God's always in control, man, <laughs> what do you have to worry about? Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Call it the Lord's Prayer. I like what a lot of Bible scholars say. We really call it the disciples' prayer. It's, Jesus is not teaching himself how to pray. He's teaching us how to pray. What's the first thing you say when you're praying? Our Father. We acknowledge, number one, that he is Father. Number two, who art in heaven. We acknowledge where he is at. And as long as he's in heaven, he's above everything in this world. And as long as he's in heaven, he's above everything that besets me that is not of him. Hallowed be thy name. Listen, God don't need you to make his name holy so that his name will be holy. Jesus is teaching you to remind yourself of an inevitable truth. I don't need to pray, God, your name is holy because it makes his name holy. God is who he is whether I ever pray again. But I need to remind myself in my prayer. That's why I say prayer is not nearly as much for God as it is for you. 
Prayer's not nearly as much about you getting what you want from God as much as, much as it is God aligning you into His will. And I remind myself as I pray, God is holy. He is righteous. He's on the throne. He's not sharing split duty. It's all His and His alone. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. I love what the prophet Isaiah said. He said, his hand's not short. That he cannot save. Boy, David tested that out, didn't he? Psalm 40, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me, reached way down in the miry clay. David found out that hand wasn't too short. Nor is his ear heavy. That he cannot hear. And then David would add right here in Psalm 11, Nor are his eyes covered that he cannot see. That's good and bad, isn't it? It's good because you're never out of his sight. Don't you wish you could... I'm telling you, man, this, this whole childhood thing is, and having a kid is really affecting my life. I, I swear to you, my wife's been gone all week and I've been just sitting on the couch just thinking. I just have random thoughts. I'm bored out of my mind. Don't have nothing to do. She's the only friend I got. No, I'm just kidding. And I'm telling you out of nowhere, I thought, dear God, Judah's going to drive one day. Oh, no. And then I said to myself, no, he ain't driving. I'll take him wherever he needs to go. I mean, did y'all, y'all have that fear with your kids? I mean, you're like, and now I, I look back at what my mama would say and do and think and cry about and still cries about it some, but anyway. And I understand it now. And so it's, it's good. We're never out of his sight. Don't you wish you could keep your kids in your sight all the time? We're never out of his sight. Ever. It's a good thing. Give the other side of it. He sees everything you do. Well, I've hid it from my wife. I've hid it from my mama. I've hid it from my daddy. I've hid it from my pastor. I've hid it from my husband. Well, there's somebody that actually has the power to punish that sees everything that we do. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. I'm telling you, when I studied this sermon this afternoon, I was like, this would be a 20-minute sermon probably tonight, and here we are. Let me give you my third point, and I'll be done. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord loved, tests the righteous, verse 5, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. said, first, there's a fearless faith that we need. Secondly, there's a founded faith that we need. Let me give you a third one tonight. There's a fruitful faith that we need. To overcome fear. The Lord tests the righteous, he says, verse 5, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wood shall be the portion of their cup. See, there's a principle here. It's a principle that Paul lays out in Galatians. Law of the harvest. That which a man sows, will he also reap. And if you reap corruption, I mean, excuse me, if you sow corruption, you cannot expect to reap spiritual fruit. David, why are you not worried about the people who are pursuing you? David said, God will take care of the wicked. He'll rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. God, in His essential nature, in the essence of who He is, He hates evil. And out of necessity, he hates the evil men who do it. It is probable that David had many times... Let me just 
rephrase that. It was not probable, it was certain that David had heard throughout his life the story of that city that was so beset by sin and evil that God actually rained down fire from heaven and destroyed it and consumed it. entire book of Habakkuk, I did a study of it in my own personal quiet time several months ago. The book begins by Habakkuk asking God, God, how is it that evil men do evil and you don't punish them? God responds to Habakkuk and he says, I use evil men to accomplish my purposes. But know this, Habakkuk. That evil men will always receive the due reward for their deeds. The Babylonians carried Israel away into captivity. But God destroyed them. They had a moment where God used them to accomplish his purposes. But when he was done with them, he wiped them out. David, what gives you the confidence that you have? Why are you not scared? He said, because if there's one thing I know, it's that evil men receive the fruits of their works. But he said, you know what? I also know this, that the righteous receive the fruits of their works. For the Lord is righteous. He loves Righteousness. See, if God hates evil, God also loves the opposite of evil. What's the opposite of evil? The opposite of evil is righteousness. Not only punishes the wicked, but he rewards the righteous. And if he hates violent deeds, then he loves righteous acts. And it is... The righteous who are allowed into the presence of the Lord. The last phrase, his countenance beholds the upright. I would challenge you, you ought to do a study of Psalms 8 through 15. Here's what you'll find. Psalm 8, Psalm 9, and Psalm 10 will teach you that God has given you ultimate victory. Psalms 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 will teach you, Jennifer, you like this? That not only do you have ultimate victory, but you have continual victory in the here and the now. Every place where your foot touches, be yours. Isn't it sad that so many people have been saved? But they'll enter into heaven, and not until that moment will they shake off the chains of anxiety, fear, depression, worry, bitterness, unforgiveness, malice. You've got to be careful because a lot of those things the Bible says just can't get into heaven. I believe a lot of people are not going to find freedom until they get into heaven from a lot of those things that have bound them all of their life. And that is a shame because Christ died to free us, not just from the penalty of hell, but from the daily penalty of living in the emotions and the fears that rob us of the victory that God has given us in Him. I just want to be honest with you tonight. I'm preaching to the choir up here. I'm not just preaching at you. I'm preaching to me. Christ has died for us so that God might behold us.
old preacher, how can he behold me? I'm not righteous. You know what grace is? Grace is an exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I truly believe there may be verses as great as that one, but there's not a verse in the Bible any greater than that one. But God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. Paul said it this way in Galatians 3. He said, God made him to, come a, a, to become a curse for us so that we might be freed from the curse. Fear is a curse. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. That's a divine transaction. God says, I'll put your sin upon Jesus and I'll take the righteousness of Jesus and I'll place it onto you. And now we can come boldly before his throne of grace. Now we can be beheld by him. Not because of our own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. I'm going to say this and I'll be done. It is an affront to God for you and I to take all he's done for us and still doubt his promises. Did you hear what I said? I said it's an affront to God for us to still doubt when he has already given us so much. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. And we ask you, Lord, that you will... Help us to be the people that you want us to be. God, I know that there are many people in here tonight. Probably more than we could ever know. Who face a daily battle of fighting fear and worry and anxiety. And our culture has made us to believe that it's just part of who we are. Burned into our genetics and our DNA. Something that we just have to deal with. Cope with. But Lord, I still believe Matthew 6.33. Seek the kingdom of God first. And His righteousness. And everything else will be added to you in the right portion and in the right time. Boast not of tomorrow. Don't know what a day will bring. Consider the lilies. They don't toll or spin. God just takes care of them. Consider the birds. Just fly around. Trusting that what they need will be there in its own time. Lord, help us to trust exactly what we sang tonight. That God leads us along. Sometimes through the fire, sometimes through the flood, sometimes through the flame, sometimes through difficulties, but God, you are always leading us. Lord, my desire tonight is that somebody would get victory over the fear and the worry and the anxiety that besets them so often. God, give us that David spirit. We just look the devil flat in the face. And say, my God is bigger and badder and better than anything you can throw at me. And I won't fear. Because I know in whom I have believed. God, give us that ability to have that victory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand tonight and sing. I have